But welcome everybody to the Mary Partner Cast. Today we're super excited to learn more about fireplaces, chimneys, and all the things that burn stuff in our house. And we are welcoming Marge Paget with Hearth Masters. I'm just going to turn it over and ask Marge to tell me a little bit about herself and her husband and Hearth Masters. Okay, Kim. Uh, we've been in the chimney and fireplace industry for about 39 years now. My husband started the business on his own, and then I joined him shortly after. My brother was a chimney sweep, and he actually talked my husband into becoming a chimney sweep. So we started out as kind of a one-man chimney sweeping operation, and, and we grew the business over the years to the point now where we have uh, currently about 10 employees. When it's not COVID, we have more than that, but we're kind of on a skeleton crew right now with that. We do everything uh, as far as chimneys or fireplaces, brick ovens, masonry heaters. We design, build, and, and restore these, these items, as well as do service work. So we do inspections and chimney sweeping and dryer vent cleaning, et cetera. Okay. And we also do fire investigations. So we see what happens when, when things go wrong with these types of appliances heating appliances and chimneys, and when they're not maintained right or if they're installed incorrectly. Which could be a problem, I would say. Uh, it can be a big problem, yes. We've, we've seen the worst. And as I don't rehab the houses, I've asked Don to join us. My husband, Don Tucker, is our other guest. In case I miss a question or we need clarification, I wanted somebody that's out there in the houses a little bit more to help make sure I'm asking all the right questions. Yeah. My first question for you, we're going to jump in because I know we have a lot of new investors that don't know quite what they're looking at, or maybe you have somebody that's been investing for a long time, but I've never got up on that roof. So I'm not really sure what I'm looking at as far as chimneys go. And I haven't stuck my head up the flue. So I don't know all of the, uh, um, the ins and outs of that. So if I'm new and I'm like going to buy a house and I'm looking around and looking outside the house and inside the house with the chimney and the fireplace, what should I be looking for to indicate that there are problems? Well, the first thing that the layperson can look for is missing mortar uh, around the fireplace, the hearth area, inside the fireplace. You don't want to see any gaps in there. So that would be the, the first thing to address. Um, you want to make sure there's a working damper in the fireplace that opens and closes. Sometimes we go into a house, there's not even damper there, or it's frozen shut, rusted shut, that, that needs to be addressed. You can look up into the chimney above the damper area with a flashlight. And the first thing you should see is the smoke chamber, which is a corbelled area of bricks that leads into the flue. And you can see that with the naked eye, uh, most of it anyway. Some of the taller chambers you can't, most, Smoke chambers should be around three feet tall, but many times uh, in older homes, we might find them five or six feet. I've even seen them 10 feet tall. So you can't really see that with the naked eye, uh, but you want to look for missing mortar. And you also want to look to make sure there's a parge coating of mortar on the smoke chamber. So that would be a smooth coating. You don't want to see brick in there. And that coating, that's required by code. It's a high temperature mortar special type of mortar that uh, blocks heat from going through. And as a fire investigator, that's the most important part of the chimney because that's where most fires occur. And the reason for that is between the face wall on the outside where you see the nice pretty wall above the fireplace and the smoke chamber, there needs to be uh, at least a minimum of two inches of airspace. But a lot of times what we see builders do is put in a wood header in that space. And so you don't have the clearance to combustibles. And the only thing stopping it is uh, brick. What maybe sometimes one course of brick should be two courses of brick. And, and sometimes there isn't that. And if you have mortar wash out or you don't have a parge coating on the chamber, heat and smoke can get into that area. And then the heat basically changes, chemically changes that wood over time. It's called pyrolization. And then you have a house fire. So that's the most important. And the other thing the light person can do is go outside. 
look at the chimney, if it's a masonry chimney, and again, look for any deteriorating mortar or holes or gaps. And if you can take a screwdriver and push it into mortar, that's bad. That mortar needs, that needs to be uh, ground out and tuck pointed. Um, also look for spalling bricks, which is this bricks uh, faces popping off. And you might see little pieces of brick on the ground or something and, and wonder where that's from. Just look up at the chimney and see uh, if, if any of that is happening. And it's usually at the very top of the chimney where that starts because that's the least protected area of the chimney. So if the so chimney those are things looks like it's falling apart, it's probably a problem? Oh, it, it, it will be a big problem. <laughs> yeah, and, and that could vary as far as repair goes to, if there's a few isolated bricks that are bad and maybe the top part of the chimney is bad, we might take down a couple of courses and rebuild it and then uh, extract some of those bad isolated bricks and, and go back and then apply a professional grade water sealer to the brick to slow down that deterioration process. But once it starts, it doesn't stop. It will continue over the years. And this is largely due to the fact that some builders use soft bricks instead of hard bricks. And soft bricks absorb moisture more easily. And the moisture gets in there and then you go through freeze thaw cycles. And when it freezes, then it pushes that brick face off. So every spring people are seeing all, all this new brick on the ground and it's because of over the winter that freeze thaw cycle was going on and pushing that that face off. And then in a hundred year old house, that could be a lot of missing brick. Well, it depends on what uh, type of brick was used because a lot of times we'll see houses built in the 1880s that used very, very hard bricks and those bricks are still perfectly fine. It's the, it's the newer bricks that are actually the problem. Yeah, those new houses, I tell you. So should we inspect every chimney before we buy the property? Exactly. You need to have a professional inspect the chimney. We have had certification training. There's so much information about chimneys that you would not believe what we have to go through. And then we have to have, in order to maintain our certifications, uh, 48 hours of training every three years. It's, it's very strict. There's a lot to it. Besides what I just mentioned to you, what a professional is going to do is run a chimney camera through the system, take pictures of anything they find, provide a written report. We're going to be looking for gaps between mortar joints, deteriorated mortar joints in flue liners, uh, cracked flue tiles, damages from chimney fires, which uh, most people don't understand that this happens fairly often where there's a chimney fire and the homeowner doesn't even know it. So you could be walking into a house that you're thinking about buying and there's been a severe chimney fire and the inside is destroyed. And you don't know that because you can't see it. But then you, you purchase the house and you haven't had it inspected by a, a chimney sweep. Home inspectors don't do this, by the way. They don't do this portion. They might look at the outside and look at the firebox, but they don't climb chin, uh, up on the ladder and look at the top and they don't run cameras. So you're not gonna get a full inspection of a chimney from a, a home inspector, unless you know there's at least one in town who does do that. But um, you know, unless they have the equipment and the training to do that. But the average home inspector does not. No, 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 99% of them do not. So you want that done. And then also we're gonna be looking at the cement cap because the cement cap is like a roof for the chimney. That keeps rainwater out of the chimney chase, is what it's called, so that you don't have rainwater running down in between the flue tile and the, and the chase itself and washing out mortar. Then uh, we're gonna look at the um, condition of the flue from the top. If there's a chimney cover that's adequate, or if it's something that's, cheap and torn up, easily torn up by animals. Raccoons can just rip those cheaper covers to shreds and get in there. You can have nesting animals, uh, birds and squirrels and making flammable nests inside the chimney. And this not only goes for fireplaces, but we're also talking about gas flutes. And this is the, the furnace the, and the hot water heater. Furnace, boiler, water heater. This is the, actually the most critical chimney in the house. If 
these things are not bended properly with the correct size liner and a good liner, then they're not going to vent and CO can leak into the house. And this is something we have to have. We have to have hot water. We have to have heat. So these things have to be used, whereas a fireplace is an option to use. So that should be the, you know, if you have a chimney sweep come out to inspect a chimney, they should also inspect any gas flues in, in the house. Now, if you switch out to a high efficiency furnace, a high efficiency water heater or electric water heater, and you're not using that flue anymore, then you don't need to worry about it. Just seal it off at the top and go on. You know, or even if it's in poor condition, you might tear the chimney down. Otherwise, just leave it and seal it off at the top. Is that what we did at our house, Don? Well, yeah, Marge, I was going to ask a question. Well, how do you know if the furnace is going up the chimney or not? Because sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. How do you, how, how would you tell people to, to distinguish that fact? Well, we can do a draft test. But uh, I mean, and then you can do a CO test with a CO detector to fire up the furnace or water heater and then test to see if there's anything coming back. Um, and the thing about uh, water heaters too, you, you don't want to, the, you don't want to aban leave an abandoned hot water heater is what we call it, where you have taken a furnace away and you're venting it out the side with high efficiency and you leave the water heater to draft on its own. Well, they can't the flue is too big. So the flue has to be resized down, usually four inches, depends on the size. Um, that has to be resized down so that water heater can vent. And this is a really, really common problem. Okay. But the homeowner isn't gonna know. I mean, you can put CO detectors. Uh, you don't wanna put it right in the same room as the furnace hot water heater because at startup, they're all gonna have a little bit of spillage. But once they get going, they're drafting. And so you want to put a CO detector on each level of the house. And if it goes off, there's nothing wrong with it because CO is odorless and tasteless and you can't see it and it's invisible. If it goes off, get out of the house. Okay, because that, that's, that's a high level. It has to be at nine parts per million for at least 10 minutes. But here's the thing about CO, low levels that are undetectable can still be in the house. And over a long period of time of being exposed to low levels, people can get ill. They can feel like flu-like symptoms. When they're in the house, they feel sick. And when they go outside the house, they get better once they get some fresh air. Um, and you wanna make sure that fresh air is introduced into the house uh, for that reason. And as we tighten up our houses, put in lots of insulation, get new doors, windows, all that stuff, well, now you've created another problem, and that is a, a sealed up house with all kinds of toxic air in it, you know, from breathing and then off gassing from uh, like furniture and cabinets and things like that, but also heating appliances. Marge, I got a question. If you've got such a dangerous level with the uh, CO coming out of these chimneys, what is your solution um, you know, based on a, a poor chimney, what is your solution to handle uh, the furnace and hot water tank? If they're both run by gas. Well, if the chimney is the correct height and it has a correct size liner and the, it should vent fine. And if the liner is in good condition, there would be no leaks. It should vent fine. And that can be tested. If there's still a negative air pressure problem in the house, then uh, that means that the, the appliances won't function. They could backdraft. You could, if you say burn a fireplace and it smokes and you can't find any other reason, it, again, the flu's the right height. It's sized correctly to the fireplace opening, all that. And it's, and it's still not venting. Then we test for negative house pressure. And if that's the case, we have a solution. It is a whole house ventilator. And that is connected to a forced air furnace now, if you don't have a forced air furnace, it doesn't work. But with a forced air furnace system, it brings in fresh air from the outside on demand. And it works both actively and passively. So that is a solution. There are some others out there. Well, what if they, if the flu chase, if the flu chase, the mortar is gone from the flu tile, 
Um, right. Oh, do you that's put in a, do you put in a sleeve? Well, okay. It's a, it's a stainless steel liner system. If the mortar is gone and there's no crack tiles, we have a method that uses a product called FireGuard. It's a ceramic joint filler and a sealant. And it's, it's done with a, this big vibrating bell sponge that's drawn up while the mixture is pouring in. And we use a winch uh, system to do this. So all of those gaps then are filled in and the, and the flu is good again. If it's, if it's sized correctly for the fireplace, it's good. Now, if there are cracks, those tiles have to come out in most cases in order to allow for a correctly sized new stainless steel liner. If you downsize the, the flu by putting one inside the tile liner, that fireplace is probably not gonna work. It's gonna smoke and then it's not gonna be usable. So mm -hmm. the flu tiles in most cases have to come out. And, and then, they're, they're like clay pots, correct? The, the old fashioned- yeah, It's terracotta. Yeah, it's fired at high temperature. It's harder than a, than a clay pot is, but it's, <clears throat> it's terracotta. Yeah, well, that's what it looks like. Okay. Yeah, well, my, my experience has been that when I see a fireplace, I automatically pencil in uh, money to put a, a sleeve in the chimney liner because it seems like every one we look at is cracked and the mortar is cracked or the, the flu liner is cracked. So we have the tile busted out. I've never regrouted. That's the first I've heard of that regrouting. That's probably a lot cheaper. But we end up be. taking the tile completely out and putting in a stainless steel sleeve. Yeah, and, and it needs to be insulated with a half inch of ceramic wool foil face insulation uh, with a top plate and a rain cap and, and sealed to the smoke chamber. So this process is not uh, short. It usually also requires that we break out the damper on the lower, on the inside and take out some bricks so we can actually get in there to do that work. Or sometimes on the outside of the chimney, we're taking out a section of brick and, and going in that way to do that. So this isn't a quick and easy fix. It takes a while to do. And it usually, um, well, always requires scaffold uh, to, to do that. So I, I'm looking at a house that's older than 10 years old that has a fireplace and I'm going to rehab it or I'm going to hold it as a rental and I want to put in some number in there before I have you come inspect just so that I can buy the house. What kind of numbers would you put into your rough estimate for a chimney liner or to replace a flue liner on a furnace? Just uh -huh. a rough estimate, not an exact. On, on a furnace, I would allow anywhere from 900 to 2200. It depends on the size of the liner and the length and how we're going to access the chimney, because obviously some houses are much more difficult to get to than others. Um, or we can put in a high efficiency furnace and eliminate the need for that flue and then cap it off. Yeah, and an electric uh, water heater or a high efficiency water heater. And, and yeah, you can, once we get into the longer, taller, chimneys they're going to be a much more expensive so uh it might be it might be more cost effective especially if you have an older furnace and you know you're thinking about yeah i should probably change it out to a high efficiency anyway it'd make the house more sellable um you, you might want to go that route but for a shorter flu it'd probably be less expensive to have the the flu liner put in what about a liner in the chimney uh, to, to yeah. do for a fireplace, again, size of the fireplace, size of the flue, and how to get to it is, is you know, is going to be the cost. I would allow a minimum of 6000 and up from there. I mean, I've, we've done like multiple flues in a chimney and multiple chimneys and on larger houses and we get into some, some high dollar, but minimum six, probably 14000 to fourteen something like that. And what if we decide that, like we did in the house we're at right now, we needed all three. So we needed a liner for the chimney. We needed the liner for the furnace and the hot water heater. So we put in a high efficiency furnace and electric hot water heater. And we decided the fireplace was no longer going to have a fire in it. What are some options to use that fireplace? What can we do that's not going to need that liner? What can we put in the well, there's fireplace? Several things. You, you could... Um close it off and not use it and just put some candles in there. Or you could put an electric insert in, like if it's going to be a rental, 
that might be an, an option to think about because it adds a little bit of ambiance. Uh, it doesn't look 100% real, but it adds a little bit of ambiance. Now, the other thing you could do is a set of gas logs, but what people don't realize is with venting or non-venting gas logs, that flue liner still needs to be good. So it does not change the fact that you've got an issue. So you're going to probably need a flue liner anyway. And then uh, a gas insert, a high efficiency gas insert or wood burning insert would use its own flue liner system. With a gas, it's two small collinear liners. And with a wood, it's one uh, six inch stainless steel liner that comes with the insert. Now these are high efficiency. They are on the high end as far as expense goes, but it could be less expensive than doing a flue liner on a larger chimney. So you have to weigh, you know, the pros and cons after you get an estimate for that. But you could be looking anywhere from hmm, probably 6,000 to 8,000 for an, an insert. But you do have the, um, the convenience with gas of a remote control and you're not hauling in wood and you're just beep, you know, and you've got flame. And it's cleaner um, on the environment because the gas burns cleaner than fire, than wood. Well, well, yeah, except the, the new inserts, the new wood burning inserts burn very clean. So, I mean, EPA regulations are very, very strict on those. And the new regulations that just came out uh, last year are um, making uh, every insert that's being sold now is super high efficiency. So I wouldn't worry about the environment so much because both the gas and the wood are going to be clean burning. Now, the only really big difference between the two is that wood is going to produce twice the number of BTUs as gas, but you still get heat and say in the middle of an ice storm, that gas appliance or wood burning appliance is going to be able to be used. They will both work. The blower systems won't work because they're electric. But those appliances will come on. And a lot of my customers told me that, you know, over times when there was no electricity, um, they had heat in their house. They didn't have to leave their house. Well, that's, that's one way to, to keep your house warm is the burn. Yeah, something. it's it's great for emergency it's heating. And ask, you know, anybody in Texas uh, over the winter that went through that and they were not prepared with a heating appliance, uh, it's, it's no fun. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll go on from rehabbing and repair to basic maintenance. Um, let's say I have a rental house with a fireplace in it or my own house. How often and what should we be doing to maintain those fireplaces so that we don't have to have you come relight our chimney? Right. Well, they need to be inspected once a year annually. And that goes for any type of a heating or decorative appliance. If you're only burning wood uh, in a fireplace a couple of times a year for the holidays, then don't have us come out every year. You know, every two or three years is fine. But things can happen in between time, like rain, washing out mortar joints or things like that in between time. So that don't have anything to do with the person burning or using that fireplace. So it should be inspected. And then if it's necessary, then it needs to be swept for wood burning uh, to remove flammable creosote. I mean, and all wood creates creosote. I don't care if it's dry, hardwood, seasoned, it will still produce some creosote. It also depends on how you burn. You wanna burn only dry wood, seasoned wood, et cetera, and not anything else. Don't put any railroad ties in there or any wrapping paper that's toxic or anything like that, just cordwood. Uh, but with gas appliances, uh, direct vent inserts, direct vent gas fireplaces, they need an annual tune-up and cleaning service. And a lot of people are not aware of this. They just buy the appliance and they, and they let it go. They don't read the instructions. And if this isn't done, it's just not going to function. Those, all those little orifices have to be cleaned out because little tiny spiders go in and build webs and then they block the orifices um, dust can get in there, things like that. So they, it needs to be tuned up to be maintained. It, they don't just work forever. And they right. are, there are, there's components that go bad too with after a while um, that have to be replaced. 
And then you had mentioned uh, checking the dampers. Um, one of our fireplaces, we don't use it as a fireplace. The, the previous owner had a wood stove in there, but the damper system is completely gone. Um, right. We're probably never going to use this fireplace again because we've been told that the fireplace is not safe at all. Um, is there a way to block off that flu um, if we don't have a damper? Yeah, I would suggest a either sealing off the top of the flue if you're never, ever going to use it again, although you know who to call to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but another thing you can do is, is put a top ceiling damper cap on. And this is a heavy-duty stainless steel, and, it, and it's operated with a chain uh, from below. So from inside the fireplace, you can close this damper completely off, and nothing's getting in there. Rain's not getting in there, insects... Uh, birds, things like that. And then if you want to use it again, you can always just open that um, and, and use the fireplace. Okay. Well, cool. What else am I not asking you that you get from investors? Like when you're at the Mary meeting, what's a question? Have I gotten all the questions of the investors come and ask you at the, the meeting? The number one, oh yes, absolutely, Kim. Uh, the, the number one thing is they ask is how often do I have, need to have my chimney cleaned? And the answer is, have us come out and look at it, see how you're burning, see how much creosote there is at, for, you know, for a wood burning fireplace. And then, and then we'll let you know, we'll ask you about your wood burning habits and how much you're burning. And then we'll let, we'll give you an idea, but it's usually annually, um, you know, for, for most wood burners, if it's a wood stove, uh, that's an insert or freestanding wood stove and you're using this for heating then twice during the season, now, the reason for that is that creosote builds up and then it clogs up the flue, okay? So the, the chimney is clogged and uh, gases can't, you know, can't draft. So that needs to be cleaned in order for that to draft properly and that stove to work correctly. Yeah, the last house we bought, they had a wood stove, but it, it looked like they were chimney sweeps. They had their own personal chimney sweep kit so that they could clean their flue. I didn't know... Some homeowners would do that, but these there are there are a few diehard wood burners who are you know very uh, good at what they do, and some of them do have cleaning you know brush sets. But I would suggest at least have a professional come out once in a while to check the system, because you know we we can identify things that the average person can't that might be a problem. And then the average person isn't going to have the camera system to go in and look. No, they're not going to have a $5,000 camera system to do that. Uh, they're not going to have the equipment that we do. We, we use tarps and vacuums when we clean to protect the house from soot and dust. Um, you know, generally speaking, it sh that should be left to, to a pro. All right. Well, we've covered most of the stuff that the real estate investor would probably ask you about as far as the chimneys and the liners. But you also deal with a few other things like design build, like for patios, fireplaces. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we build outdoor fireplaces and uh, outdoor brick ovens with counter systems, kind of like, you know, an outdoor kitchen. We actually also show people how to use their wood fired oven. And Gene will come out and do a pizza party after, you know, after everything is cured out. And he'll show everybody show the homeowner how to make pizza and, and, and cook it in the oven because there's a whole technique about that. Uh, we've taken all kinds of lessons on that. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. And, and, you know, outdoor fire pits, outdoor fireplaces to, to sit around. Um, that can really add a lot of ambiance, especially, you know, if you are a, a, an investor and you have a, a nicer home and you want to highlight that home and make some features about it that, are not common, uh, put an outdoor kitchen out there, put an outdoor fireplace or a fire pit. People will love it. Yeah. The fire pits I think are not for rentals, but great for right. us trying to sell the house. Flips. Yes. Yes. Well, how do we find you? If we are trying to reach out to you to get some help, how do we, how do we get in touch with you? Well, call me at 816-461-3665. Or visit our website at chimkc.com. at C-H-I-M-K-C dot com. Perfect. Well, I am looking forward to uh, seeing you and getting to talk more about fireplaces when we finally get back in person, which I think is going to be in July. 
Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for joining us, Don. You gave us some questions that I wouldn't have thought of. All right, thank you. Thanks, Don. All right, All right bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.